Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of fun. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And um, so I'm here today to be able to talk a little bit about NERVS Project. But before I begin, I just want to say we are engineers, every one of us. And we have this fantastic ability to look around at the world and see it in this different way than everybody else. And in this way, we uh, typically like to identify problems. And we see these problems and we think to ourselves, you know, if I could just control that, I could make it a little bit of a better experience. I could um, save some time during the day. I could uh, get rid of this monotonous task. And, you know, well, if I measure this and I capture this data, ah, all of a sudden now we have this new way of putting things together. We can see our problems mapped out. We can see how if we take this thing and it works with this thing and then this thing over here works, then voila, we can solve that problem. And this system isn't new. I mean, this is basically how we as engineers view this world. We're used to these kinds of things. And this could be anything. Let's say, for example, that we have this app and this app needs to be able to communicate over a wire to a weather API. And that weather API then it asks for the weather, and then maybe like it sends a message over email or SMS to our uh, to somebody else in reaction to checking that kind of event. And the the the, the connection lines that we draw here, uh, as we know, are uh, completely rock solid and work 100% of the time always, right? Yeah. That weather API will never go down. Messaging will always work. And the world will always be perfect. Yeah, we know that's false. <laughs> but it's funny, I mean, uh, this right here would illustrate sort of what we would see as like web developers or application developers. You know, we're used to the network being unstable. But really, these problems have striking similarities to the ones that we would see with embedded spaces. Let's say we have a device, and that device needs to monitor the temperature from a temperature probe. And maybe in reaction to when the temperature gets too low or too high, we actuate a fan. And these devices, these sensors, they're all connected using wires. And so why are those wires any more special than the ones that we're using to connect us to these weather APIs or these messaging services? The reality is, is that more and more, I, there's this similarity that we can see between this architecture that we see in the web and its modeling and the domain of the way that we model and see things in, in the embedded space. Microservices, literal microservices. <laughs> so we have these uh, rules now, and we start to kick off our project. And we go, OK, we need these things here. We got a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, we got this transparent border around it of these separate, separate but connected kind of things, you know, that they kind of depend on each other, but, but they don't, you know, directly, and uh, they might communicate back and forth, and they're wrapped up nicely in this thing I'd like to call the product domain, right? It's this, like, invisible box that we put stuff into. And the problems that uh, we get at this point are a little bit more interesting. Um, we start to realize things like, you know what, uh, inside of this box, uh, how do we protect ourselves and make this uh, resilient? You know, resiliency is going to be a way that we can uh, push these uh, systems forward to make them maintainable. Because what happens, who's responsible in this sort of uh, microservices box, this loosely coupled box, when something were to crash? And typical responses back in the day would be, well, let's just watch it with a watchdog. Well, who watches the watchdog? 
So from there, another thing that starts to complicate this sort of uh, container, this transparent location, this product domain, is uh, making it reproducible. Because we, when we have these things running and they're in production, we want to make sure that the monster just doesn't take charge and grow out of control. We love these concepts of immutability because when things start to mutate, uh, the world becomes quite complicated. And furthermore, these systems need to be reasonable. I mean, with dependency management systems these days, it's quite easy to be able to pull in tons of tons of packages, but then your output becomes less and less understood, and the context that it takes to drive it into the developer's mind is almost too much for one individual person. And now I know when projects get to become a certain scale, that's sort of inevitable, but Reason, being, being reasonable about your systems means that you're making uh, uh, informed and intelligent decisions about the understanding that you have over what you're actually shipping. And most of the time, what we see in sort of embedded domains is like, they'll have this problem and all of a sudden they don't know how to ship it and look, bam, Ubuntu, let's just throw that out there. I mean, that's like a desktop operating system that we're gonna just deliver a bunch of embedded stuff onto. Now, all of a sudden, there's hundreds of megabytes of packages that we don't need or understand that we're pushing out into production, and we may or may not have done enough to protect the rest of the product domain from that, uh, those uh, packages and uh, their interactions, the ones that we don't need. And so the question then becomes for us, how do we build maintainable embedded systems? Because Designing for the problem is one thing, but designing the problem so that it's resilient in the future is another. And that's what we're trying to be able to accomplish with NERVS Project. So from the ground up, we can see this model here of like sort of this, this problem domain, or this uh, product domain, right? And uh, when we model our problems in this way or, uh, and try to come up with solutions in this sort of graph, it very much so resembles the actor model. You have these little encapsulated uh, processes or services, and they might send messages to each other, and the other end might be up or it might be down, but uh, you're not directly tied to those. You can just wait for your response, or you can act accordingly. And so therefore, it's believed in this case, so because of these patterns, that the actor model just is a beautiful blend. It's a, it's a perfect fit to be able to uh, model these uh, kinds of problems. And so therefore, if we were to then build a stack where we put Erlang as the center of the universe in our OS, then uh, we can uh, take all of this encapsulated service or these sensors or these devices, and we can monitor them as processes responsibly using the Erlang VM. And this right here, this is the NERVS runtime. This transparent box that we have is basically the Linux kernel that boots Erlang, and Erlang will then control your application workflow. Let's look at this a little bit more deeply. So the bottom layer here, yes, our operating system, uh, and we get all of the benefits and drivers that we can get from uh, the Linux kernel, and then all of the benefits that we get from the Erlang VM and the application domain. This is where you'd put all your logic and your business logic stuff. And in that container, you can fill that with anything. We're not telling you that you have to take the NERVS runtime and do all your work in Elixir. What we're saying is that we're giving you this box, and what you put in this box will get certain guarantees. And that box can be filled with code that runs Elixir, Erlang, C, Python, whatever you might need. In addition, we can see that you can also use this in a means of communicating and monitoring, let's say, connections to other sensors or processes, uh, in this case, like uh, Arduinos or microcontrollers. And so from here, we can start to now build a picture of solutions to those problems that we have for how to build maintainable systems. Resilient uh, systems are now possible with Erlang's supervision structures, because if processes were to just crumble and go away, then we know that Erlang can bring them back, and we have solutions for these now. The nice part about this is that no longer do we have to sort of depend on external forces to be able to have an understanding of how to solve these problems, 
the tools are available to us in a familiar place, Erlang, as we know, and therefore, it lowers the cognitive load for us as developers to understand these kinds of systems so that we can de design them for resiliency and these failure cases. The system is also uh, resilient because of the way that we handle uh, uh, updates. Uh, this illustration here is showing the layout of what uh, uh, the uh, memory space with the uh, SD card or in uh, industrial uses too, you can use EMMC memory or uh, the uh, disk uh, space of the uh, device that we're building. Uh, we put things into a, a, a two partition strategy. So it's kind of like the blue green deployments where you have the known good working location that you're booted from and you will stream firmware, let's say into the dimmed one on the right in this case. Uh, and then once that loads in, you can try to be able to boot off of it. And if it works then stay booted there and then stream the next one into the other side. If things go wrong, you can fail back and recover. This is really important for embedded systems because these devices are installed in places sometimes that we just can't have physical access to very easily. Um, in addition, we also give you an, a, uh, an extra place for uh, storing your application data. Um, that's a read-write location that you can use and consider for data migrations or anywhere that you might need to be able to store some uh, information for the runtime. So from here, let's see uh, how else we, the, the NURBS runtime handles things with reproducibility. Well, reproducibility is kind of uh, a large concept. For one, uh, there's a few things to touch on. We mount everything as read-only in the root file systems, except for that application data partition. That's where you can read-write. Because it's mounted as read-only, that means that when you turn that board on, that's gonna come up the same way every time. So the, when, if you were having issues, you power it out, down and back up again, then it's gonna boot the same way because there was no modification to the root file system because it's mounted as a read-only system. In addition, we get the same benefits that we get with the immutable data structures. It's not like we have to worry about uh, our state getting mutated in ways that they would in other languages. And from a build perspective of reproducibility, we are working uh, towards uh, the reproducible builds. This is a tedious job. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in uh, curation of packages just to be able to prevent things from like timestamps or um, the usernames uh, uh, th that sneak into sort of like the metadata of these builds uh, that make things change just the slightest bit uh, when it comes to producing bit for bit reproducible builds. This is a big task and work needs to be done uh, in uh, all the different areas of the stack, but um, NERVS is built on top of this package called BuildRoot and BuildRoot very much so under the hood also has a, an effort moving forward to try to be able to uh, remove a lot of this as possible. But as you can say, it's tedious because you basically have to look through all of the different options of packages and uh, try to make these changes. And in addition, we produce reasonable systems in these runtimes. And the biggest reason for this is the uh, approach that NERVS takes is a whitelist approach where you're building up. Uh, this is sort of the counter from the blacklist approach of putting Ubuntu down or some other desktop operating system. In that case, you need to uh, determine the things that you don't want, right? Which is great when you know the things that you don't want but it doesn't protect you against all of the things that you don't know that you don't want. So in that case, that all sneaks in. You don't know it exists. And then maybe CVEs come around and you don't even know that you need to patch them because you didn't even know that they were on their system. With the whitelist approach, you only ship the things that you need and therefore you're able to also produce really lean, minimal output runtimes. Uh, from a start, we have, uh, um, as an example, the official NERVS uh, systems, um, the Raspberry Pis, um, right now are uh, shipping at uh, about like 25 to 30 megabytes, but that you know, still has some effort that we can trim up. We really wanna make that uh, even smaller, and that's everything, by the way. Uh, Linux kernel, Erlang VM, and your application code space. 
Um, but we can make that smaller and also um, work towards minimizing that output as well. There's some convenience things that we turn on in our systems that you may not need to turn on in your systems for your production things. And so NERVS is, building, is a foundation for building resilient embedded systems. And these are the things that we're trying to focus on with the project. We want to make it easy for developers to uh, ship existing code that they already have and not feel the pressure to have to rewrite everything in Erlang or Elixir to realize these benefits of this container, of this runtime. Um, and we also want to be able to make it so that the projects can last for a long period of time and that there is a strategy for maintaining them and that it doesn't feel like a burden and that it doesn't feel like you're always fighting fires. So we're building resilient embedded systems. And let's talk a little bit about what we've done over the last year. Well, I'm happy to be able to show this one. We finally pr crossed over 100,000 downloads, which is, yay, fun. Thank, thank you. <laughs> uh, and over the last year, we've also made a few releases. Um, now, uh, we've all, we put out NERVS 1.4 and NERVS 1.5 over the last year. And it's funny because we only have two major points to be able to put here. Uh, the stability of the build portion of our platform, uh, once we sort of hit like 1.0, reached a point where it, there wasn't a lot of new feature or change, necessary change that had to go into place. Things were quite stable. And so therefore, a lot of our minor release bumps uh, were due to just uh, um, uh, catching up with the uh, pushing some stuff upstream. Um, in NERVS 1.4, we shipped with Elixir 1.8 uh, support, which came with uh, mixed target uh, built in. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with mixed target, it's similar to mixed ends, um, but it's um, a sort of another uh, uh, layer that you can use to be able to choose what your target is that you're compiling for. For example, if you're not using cross-compilation or you're not building for tiny computers, then typically your target is the same host or, that you're running on. Or uh, in this case, we have Raspberry Pis. Mixed target would be set to say, like, OK, I'm on my host, but I'm going to compile for a Raspberry Pi. By bringing that into Elixir, um, it's given us the ability to uh, simplify a lot of the configuration of your projects and also the layout of the build art, uh, uh, components and the dependencies inside of your uh, project. And then with NERVS 1.5, uh, we came out with support for Elixir 1.9 and support for mixed releases. Um, prior to NERVS 1.5, uh, we built our, uh, when, when you produce firmware to run on these devices, we would use distillery to build an OTP release, take that release and marry it with the system that uh, NERVS runtime um, and ship that into uh, production. With Elixir 1.9, uh, we have now an optional dependency on distillery. Uh, you can continue to use that, um, but um, all of the uh, Elixir 1.9 projects forward will start to build off of mixed releases, and that's out and available today. In addition, over the last year, we've got some new boards to be able to support by default, one of which is the Raspberry Pi 4. And this one's really fun because uh, it's got some uh, pretty impressive tech specs to it. Um, the Raspberry Pi 4 has a 1.5 gigahertz quad core processor. You can buy it in uh, models uh, with one, two, or four gigs of RAM. Um, it's got built-in Wi-Fi for 2.4 and five gigahertz connections, Bluetooth 5.0 with BLE support, gigabit ethernet, finally, and also dual HDMI display outputs. Pretty neat. Also, we've been working on trying to clean up some of our runtime support. Um, in addition to NERVS being thought of as building these resilient run embedded runtimes, uh, we also offer a series of libraries that will help you in that runtime uh, boot up and do things like bring up the network uh, or um, you know, interact with hardware, things like that. And so uh, one of these uh, that we've been working on is a NERVS networking uh, replacement or NERVS network replacement. Uh, we've moved it out into its own GitHub repository for work, and the newer stack is called VintageNet. Um, I just got this the other day, too. It was great. Uh, grapes, vintage. No, sorry. Uh, Frank and Connor, uh, Frank Hunleth and uh, Connor Rigby and uh, their teams uh, um, have been uh, uh, developing this. 
uh, for um, FarmBot, SmartRent, and so um, they've been doing a lot of great work on bringing this uh, forward. VintageNet is to be a more stable replacement to the networking stack that we have, and also to support additional uh, features, uh, such as uh, multi-homed internet connections, so you can support both uh, connected to Wi-Fi and Ethernet at the same time, and then automatically support, uh, automatically make it so that if one of those connections were to fail, that it would allow you to c continue to route out to the network. Um, you can also support AP mode, and uh, which means uh, uh, your device can fire up as an access point, and people can connect to it. It's a common provisioning mechanism for these, uh, where when you plug the product in to start, it'll just broadcast its own Wi-Fi network. You'll join that, write some configurations, and then it'll reset. Because this is such a common thing, there's also been work uh, in the vintage net here. You can see the vintage net wizard, and that's uh, um, in progress moving forward too. If you'd like to get involved in this, uh, there's uh, everything that you can work on from embedded networking to even uh, web-based front ends with the uh, wizard. Uh, Wizard's a, a, a utility that uh, allows you to be able to just render a web page very easily to let you choose that wireless network uh, for configuring the device to connect then to the, your home network. So what happens is you choose your network, you plug in the credentials, the device reboots, it doesn't bring up the access point mode, and it connects to your home Wi-Fi, and you can start using your device. All right, so we have also have a series of tools that help at runtime to work with embedded hardware. And this is really cool stuff. Uh, Elixir circuits. So Elixir circuits, uh, um, it's been around for a little bit now. We've, uh, it's sort of like the new, uh, if, ever, if anybody's familiar with Elixir Ale, um, Elixir Ale was the, the, the sort of uh, first layer uh, um, of helper libraries to be able to work with uh, protocols like I2C or Spy. And, and these are sort of like protocols that you'd use to communicate with sensors or devices. And uh, um, with circuits, we're taking a new approach to try to be able to help people get up and running quickly which is to be able to provide these quick start projects. And the idea behind a quick start project is that all of the work necessary of setting up nerves on your host machine so that you can create an application and then build it and then put it onto an SD card and then burn it and boot it in your device and then bring it up and plug it into their network so you can actually get to it, can get taken out and replaced with the idea that you can download a firmware image and use tools to burn that to the card, plug it in, and then just SSH into it using uh, a, 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 um, a known username and password. And the nice thing about this is that if you want to just buy a device or a sensor or something off the shelf and plug it in and start playing with it, you can get up and running with that pretty quickly. And so uh, here's basically the concept. Yes, you burn an SD card, you pop that into your device, then you fire up a shell session, you say SSH to circuits at nerves.local, and everything's successful, you'll log in uh, using the password circuits, you'll get the, uh, some wonderful ASCII art, and uh, it'll get you to an IEX session. That IEX session's then loaded with a lot of uh, the Elixir circuits libraries to help you um, start communicating with these ones. So let's take a peek at this real quick. So here I have... And in the back, yeah? Okay. All right, so here we have a, a device connected. And this device has, a, 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 it's just a Raspberry Pi Zero. And it's got this thing called the Enviro P hat on top of it, which is um, just like a board that plugs in. Uh, it's, a, it's a hat that just connects to the Raspberry Pi header. You know, you can buy them at Adafruit. And it's got a, just a collection of some sensors and lights on it and everything. And so we're just going to uh, plug that in, download Quick Starts, and fire it up. Now, I've already put that on that device, so we should be able to SSH to uh, circuits at nerves.local. And voila, we're into an uh, IEX prompt. From here, we can uh, do things like, I can say, you name. We can see what we're booted off this device. Um, we can see, like, the firmware image and stuff like this. It's little friendly uh, helper methods that Nerves has. Uh, but we can start poking at some stuff here. So one, one part of Elixir Circuits is the GPIO libraries. The Elixir Circuits GPIO lets us communicate directly with these individual general purpose input output pins, or GPIOs as they're called. And these lights that are on here are connected to GPIO pins. And so the first thing we'll do is we're just going to tell Elixir Circuits that we want to open uh, GPIO pin. Oops. 
There we go. GPIO pin 4 as an output. And that's going to give us back the LEDs reference, right? And then what we can do is we can just write to those LEDs uh, 1 or 0. Um, and so if I bring up my camera here, we can see if I do -ba do. It's hard to hold a device. Type on a keyboard. There we go. One, bright lights, and zero, bright lights off. So that's GPIO. GPIO is pretty simple. You can just turn stuff, uh, wires, you can go high or low with them. But let's do a little bit more complicated, I square C. Uh, looks like I need to capture that reference. So. All right. And uh, to set up this, uh, uh, there's an accelerometer on this device. And to set it up, it just requires some stuff. I, I square C is a little bit uh, different of a protocol. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically that you write uh, to these devices. Every device has an address. So this here is the address of the device. And then you're going to write a bunch of bytes. And what you write is going to be dictated by the data sheet, usually, of that device and how it expects you to communicate with it. Um, so in this case here, I know that uh, this works, but uh, we're just going to plug this guy in here. That's going to configure our accelerometer. And then what we can do is we can read the accelerometer. So uh, I'm just going to run this line here. This is a, read, a, a, a write read command, where it's going to uh, basically tell the device that we want to pull the data out of this. Oops. And we get back a bunch of data. And in order to decode it, one of the other uh, wonderful benefits of Elixir is the binary pattern matching. And so if we see here, this right here is a binary pattern. And it allows us to say that I want to capture x as a signed little of 16 size uh, and y and z. So it's going to basically let us very easily destructure our data. All right. Now, that returned. Not too much, because we have to convert for the Gs. We're assuming that we're in this uh, 2G mode. And voila, here we go as our last bit. We can see that gravity is normal. Everybody's feeling one unit of gravity today? Yeah? We can uh, run these if I, if I turn this on its side, let's say, and we rerun in some of these commands here. We're going to grab the data. We're going to destructure. And a little of that. Now we can see, oh, 0 0.09 on the left there, so it's working normally. So this is an easy way for us to be able to get up and running with this. Now there's also uh, circuits SPI um, that you can use uh, and uh, a UART connections to be able to work with these devices. All right. Now, last year when we were here, we talked about how uh, one of the problems that we're having was when you uh, push firmware to these devices locally, it's convenient. You can just stream it directly to one device, update it, reboots, perfect. But how do we handle deployments in the field? And our answer to that was that we started working on a project called NervesHub. The gist of NervesHub is that we have a server, the NervesHub web server. And that server, uh, it's written using Phoenix uh, and uses LiveView. And using Phoenix channels, your devices can connect to it and receive uh, firmware updates. This allows you to be able to logically group devices. So you can say, uh, these ones are production, these ones are testing, these might be QA. And then you can even go further to tag them and say, these QA devices are belonging to this person or this group. And then you can structure deployments in a way that you can target everything down to specific individual devices, all the way up to full groups of entire uh, production deployments. Phoenix Channels isn't the only way to be able to use this. You can also pull the service in situations where maybe you don't need constant connections to the server for receiving uh, instant updates, but you wanted to be able to, let's say, um, maybe once a night look for uh, software updates or in low power modes, or, uh, or also to save money on uh, metered connections if you're using LTE or something like that. And so with NerveSub, we've been uh, focused primarily uh, uh, like uh, on security, because everybody knows that the joke, right? The S in IoT is for security. Yeah. Well, we don't want that joke to really exist and apply in our cases. So we are trying to do as much as possible to make security 
less of a hassle for people using NerveSub. And one way that we're doing that is with uh, crypto authentication chips. This right here is an AT ECC 608A uh, crypto authentication chip. Uh, the size of it on this slide is by far very large compared to its actual size in real life. And, uh, um, and what does this do? Well, the, this chip, essentially, it holds all of the private information. Like, you think about SSL, you have a private key and a, a public certificate. Um, and we generate these private keys, and we're like, oh, we have to keep this protected. You know, and nobody can see this, and we should probably hide it. Right? And so, like, the idea with a crypto chip is the private key is generated on the chip, and it never leaves the chip. And so, therefore, you can never get the private key. You can only ask the chip to be able to do some crypto uh, 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 operations for you. So essentially, this chip, uh, Erlang, can delegate the uh, crypto responsibilities for SSL to this chip so that it can uh, uh, perform all of the required uh, steps uh, to verify the private key without the private key ever having to leave it. They do a lot of work to prevent these from also being able to be copied, um, but it's a much, uh, it's a great step forward in trying to be able to prevent uh, mishaps, like having uh, passwords or private information stored in the clear on these devices. To make it easier to be able to install for developers, now, uh, uh, well, if you're doing a production board, you can basically take this and lay it down under the board, uh, this uh, ATECC uh, 608 or 508A chips uh, right under the board and tie it in. It's, it's very easy, it's very low cost part and uh, it'll save you a lot of time uh, and, and headaches. But to make it easier for developers, uh, we've been producing uh, these uh, little tiny daughter boards called NervesKey. And NervesKey is just basically this. It's the uh, ATECC chip uh, put down onto a board that can be very easily soldered onto the back of a Raspberry Pi. Um, or you can also put a socket on it and just plug it into the header. Or you can just wire up jumpers to it and connect it to the I2C bus of anything that you need. Uh, this stores all the private information, but it also has spaces for you to be able to put additional certificates. Um, another key feature of these chips, by the way, is that they're, they're the, the main memory zone on them is write once, which means once you provision them, they you cannot be provisioned in that space again, preventing them from being able to be overridden. But you can put additional certificates on in a read-write location. And it also has some extra space to be able to use as a setting store. Similar to circuits, we have a quick start for this. And so uh, one of the major problems with getting a nerve scheme is how do I configure this? Uh, because since it's right once, you don't want to make mistakes because mistakes are expensive. It means that you have to just get another one. Um, and so uh, with the nerve key quick start, you can download the same thing. Grab a SD card, put it in your machine, fire it up. It runs a Phoenix server with live view. Uh, enabled pages that then uh, you'll just go to nerves-key.local and type in some of your information and all of a sudden, voila, your device is provisioned. This is a little bit of uh, what that uh, screen looks like. So you can also pick up Nerves keys from the Tindy store. Uh, they're available in uh, quantities. You can get uh, one, five packs, uh, whatever you need. Um, uh, maybe pick up a couple of them, like I said, because if you're getting started, it's going to be—you might make a mistake. You know, you want to have an extra one in case. Now, uh, using the Nerves Key Quick Start isn't the only way to provision Nerves Keys uh, on a manufacturing line. You're going to want to interact with your devices so that you can provision them, and uh, there is a way and documentation to be able to show how to use Elixir to be able to log into your device and provision them from there. Another new feature we added to NerveSub this year is the ability to handle custom certificate authorities. So the idea with this is that you own the key and the certificate that is the root signing certificate of all your devices and their NERVS keys or ATC, ECC chips. And then what you do is that you sign each one of those devices and share just the public certificate portion of your, uh, signing, or your certificate authority with NerveSub. Then when your devices connect to the server, uh, they will be known, uh, they will, uh, the server will see that uh, they were signed by a trusted uh, certificate authority that you've provided, and they'll uh, adopt them onto your account. Uh, because we now have support for this and higher levels of security, 
Another feature that we've added is the ability for you to interrupt delegated off with Nerves Hub. The concept here is any IoT platform is going to need more than just a web, se uh, a, a web based firmware update uh, and device management server. Typically, if you're building like a device that's connected to the network, that device is going to want to report back some sort of data or uh, the state of the device. And all of those custom things about the thing that you're building would usually be handled with your own website. But because Nerves Hub has a higher level of security and already is implementing these things and has the ability to, to very easily leverage Nerves Key and that crypto authentication chip, uh, it's, uh, you can use that same structure to be able to enforce the fact that when these devices show up and connect to your server, that they are who they are uh, saying they are. So through this, um, it allows you to have access to some additional information. Here's some code examples on what we need to do to Phoenix to set this up. This is compatible with Phoenix 1.4 and on. Uh, in this case, what you can do is, in the endpoint, you would configure your WebSocket to capture the connection info of the peer data, because you need access to the SSL certificates. In the user socket, uh, in the connect callback, where the socket connections are established, in the third parameter, you will be, have access then to the SSL certificate that the device will provide. That SSL certificate can then be forwarded to Nerves Hub's API, where you can ask if this organization and this application supports the connection for this device. Nerves Hub will respond back on whether or not it trusts that device with the certificate that you said that it presented. And when it responds back, it will give you all of the additional device metadata that Nerves Hub knows about, that, uh, uh, such as its tags and uh, last connection information, things like that. Here's just a little supplement. There's a little auth function there. We need to uh, put together uh, the authorization uh, for the uh, user API. This is just a little function on the bottom that allows us to do that. Um, because what's happening is your Phoenix application is essentially uh, consuming the Nerves Hub API as a user of your account uh, to uh, validate that these devices are yours. And now, in addition, uh, for debugging information, a convenient method uh, that we've added is something called this uh, remote console. This uses Phoenix Live View on the server to be able to allow you to have a real-time real interaction, uh, IEX session, with your Nerves device uh, without having to be able to connect to it locally. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times this can, this can really save you in, uh, when you're trying to be able to put stuff out and, and, and gather some debug information. By default, the, the remote console, for security purposes, is turned off. You have to opt in with your devices to be able to turn this on. Uh, you can even, uh, with remote console, delegate it off and all these features for Nerve Sub. We've also added user roles and permissions so that account, uh, you can specify um, uh, people who are a part of your organization of Nerves Hub, who has access and the right to be able to actually act, uh, uh, use the remote console sessions. So you can lock that down. Um, and uh, you can also lock down permissions to uh, CI servers and also to um, uh, using the delegated auth functions too. So Nerves Hub is cool, but um, you know, is it this thing that only runs at nerves-hub.org? Uh, uh, nerves no. Nerves Hub is 100% open source. That's the entire Phoenix application. Actually, it's three Phoenix applications, an entire certificate authority. All of it is completely open source, which means that you can either go to nerves-hub.org, get a trial account, and try things out. You can even, as a business, if you want, continue to use nerveshub.org if you don't feel like you want to host it yourself. Um, and also, if you want to be able to run your own server privately, uh, since it's 100% open source, you can run it on your own domain. It's all unlimitedly managed and scalable by you. Now, some people might stop there and just say, hey, good luck getting it running. You know, why don't you just come to nerves-hub.org? But us, we really want to make it feel like you guys can run these on your own. So. Recently, we put together a repository of Terraform scripts that you can use to be able to go from nothing to everything on AWS. We have a fully implemented Nerves Hub server. <laughs> so
So I'd like to show just a few companies that are using NerveSub right now, um, one of which is APC. They started shipping these server room grade uh, UPS systems, uh, battery backups for very large installations. These devices are now shipping with NERVs uh, in them. Uh, it's a really cool project. Uh, smart Rent is using NERVs. Uh, they're a, uh, smart, uh, they're a uh, rental uh, property management uh, software organization that builds these devices to be able to interact with uh, uh, stuff like locks and door sensors and uplinks to the internet. Um, Bowery Farming. Uh, they build vertical indoor farming uh, uh, hydroponic solutions, uh, and they are located outside of New York right now. Uh, their devices are all running nerves in production. Uh, Latote is using it for warehouse management services. Uh, we build that machines that we install to be able to help employees in the warehouse interact with and monitor all the logistics of garments as they go through the system. And one of the cool projects that everybody loves to be able to talk about too is FarmBot. Uh, FarmBot's a lot of fun. It's basically a farming robot that you can install that uh, will uh, plant, weed, water, do all the work necessary to get you a nice farm in your backyard uh, or anywhere you want to put it. Um, here's uh, me having fun with my, my girls. We, ha we were put putting one together. It's a lot of enjoyment. All right, so that's cool stuff, right? But we talked about a lot. I want to see it all at once, right? Show it to me all at once. Well, so there's this funny part of this. Like, uh, people ask us uh, all the time, like, hey, Justin, Frank, like, how do you guys, like, keep pushing this stuff forward? You know, what do you do to keep it up interesting and fresh? Or, like, how do you, how do you like, drive new developments? Well, the funny thing about it is that um, a long time ago, Frank wrote this game, uh, wrote Snake in the browser because, uh, uh, not in the browser, sorry. He wrote Snake on the console using end curses because he had a need to be able to enhance an end curses library so that he could do some work with it. You know, so what better way to be able to test to make sure that your end curses integrations work properly than constructing the game Snake? And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I started playing it, fiddling around with it. And I was like, you know what? This is, there's just something not quite right about this game. And I, I realized, you know, the snake, if, if you were to go right and push left, it would just reverse. And then all of a sudden, you'd die. And I'm like, that's not how Snake works. So I opened an issue like a responsible developer, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, so later th uh, then after, after that incident, we started uh, putting together a training for this year. And this, this is a, a screenshot of the training that we were doing. We're using these Raspberry Pi Zeros with the OLED bonnets on top. It's a whole 128 by 64 character uh, display. And as part of that, we were, uh, you're, we're using Scenic to be able to draw to it, um, you know, and, and uh, we, we're, like, we're, we're conceptualizing the training at this point. We're like, oh, we got these displays. We want to be able to draw to it with Scenic. Can we do this? You know, try it out. And I'm like, okay. So Frank starts playing around with the OLED, and he's like just writing raw stuff to it. And he says to me, he's like, Justin, hey, can you get me like an app or something I can use just to test this? And of course, I built Snake. <laughs> You know, and, and you find it funny, ha ha, okay, here we're playing around with it. And then all of a sudden, Frank comes back to me and he goes, you know, you shouldn't be able to wrap around the display. I don't think that's how Snake works. And I'm like, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, I'm like, okay, you know what? That's, that's, that might be a good idea if you have, like, one device. But what if you have nine devices? <laughs> now what are you going to do? You have to go off the edge of the display, right? Because it's nine devices. So in the spirit of over-engineering, because we are engineers, and when we see problems, it's just fun to over-engineer them, uh, we built a little demo here for you to check some of this stuff out. And in this demo, we have nine Raspberry Pi Zeros uh, acting as a large display mimicking the one that's on the left here, which is the seven inch Pi uh, display. And so the idea is, uh, you know, we've got, we want to run Snake, right? And so to run Snake, we obviously need 13 cores of processing <laughs> and 5.5 gigs of RAM. Seems like it'd be a pretty performant game of Snake, you know? Uh, and so the concept, yeah, we're going to take the display, we're going to render Snake on the server on the left. And then the server on the left is going to capture the screen output, and it's going to divide it into segments. And those segments are then going to be transmitted using Phoenix channels 
to the displays that are running on the Raspberry Pis. And those Raspberry Pi displays are going to paint as fast as we can get them to run so we can play this game across all of the nine displays. Furthermore, we're going to have everything have nerves keys. We're going to have everything connect to Nerves Hub and be managed. And then we're going to use delegated auth for all of the device, all of the Raspberry Pi zeros that are on uh, the, uh, the right to connect to the server on the left. We're going to use delegated auth to make sure that those are actually devices we trust. And as part of that, the kicker is all the, all the devices on the right, all the Raspberry Pi zeros, they're all running the same firmware. So how do you know which frame it's supposed to be? What position it should be rendering? Well, we're going to use Nerves Hub device tag metadata to be able to dictate and drive that portion of the behavior. And because that's not quite absurd enough, <laughs> we're going to run the entire Nerves Hub stack, the entire Nerves Hub web server, on a Pi 4. Because why not? By the way, that Pi 4 also has a Nerves key on it. And the best part about it is that Pi 4 running the Nerves Hub server dog foods itself, it manages its own device. So if we want to push an update to the Nerves Hub server, we would send the file to the Nerves Hub server. The Nerves Hub server would then update itself and then reboot and bring Nerves Hub back up. All right. So to illustrate this now, in the beginning we talked about the Nerves runtime and it being a resilient container. These are the applications we're shipping in this container. These are the recipes we're building. On the Snake server, we're running Scenic, some C code that we're monitoring to be able to handle uh, uh, input events from a joystick, and we're running a Phoenix server. On the remote displays, we're using circuits to be able to write to the display, uh, circuits I square C, to write to the display. And on the Nerves Hub web server, we're trying, to, uh, we're trying a little something radical, um, which is a new series of systems that I'd like to be able to produce that we can experiment with, uh, where the Nerves Hub web server, that Pi 4, is running three Phoenix applications and Docker. Why Docker? Because it's easier to be able to run Postgres in a container than it is to try to figure out how to get Postgres to run on a read-only system. <laughs> it's a little easier to be able to configure Docker to do this. Now, you know, it's, uh, uh, I'd like to experiment with that a little bit more because in this case, the use case is actually quite nice. We can configure Docker to tell it to write to the, to the uh, application data partition, and we can tell it to mount a bunch of containers uh, that we give it control over ahead of time. Uh, and then uh, it's also then monitored using uh, the Erlang supervisors, um, and that's the big benefit. These are now resilient, deliverable systems. So let's check this out. All right. Got my camera. I'm going to put it on another display, and we're going to change inputs here. Boom. All right. So what I have here is what we showed. There are nine Raspberry Pi zeros on the right. There's a Pi 4 in the back right here. Right there. That's the Pi 4 running Nerve Sub. And the server on the left. And with this, we can see uh, all this working over WebSockets. It's uh, pretty playable if my controller is on. This is the only part of the demo that fails for me today. I will be lucky. Power back up, come on, yeah. Oh, that was a cable. There we go. Yeah, hey. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to play Snake for a while. This is just <laughs> too fun. All right, actually. All right, I want to show you a little bit here about uh, what we've got going on. So let's first check out Nerves Hub. We can see here now we have all of our devices. Right now I'm looking at the Snake remote display. Here's all of the Raspberry Pi uh, zeros showing as online. So that's all these devices over here. Um, they're all online with Nerves Hub. Uh, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to push an update because, you know, updating one display over SSH could take us pretty long if we had to do it nine times. 
And so I'm going to make a code change. And the code change I'm going to make here is uh, just in the application. I'm going to make it so that we can see when the display is being redrawn and which displays are being redrawn when by flickering the, by, by inverting the display as we go. All right, so I'm going to make this code change by commenting that in. I'm going to go back to my console here and we'll say uh, mix firmware. Step always takes longer when you're sharing video. All right, now we got our firmware. We're going to say mix uh, nerves hub firmware publish. All right, this command here says firmware publish. We're going to, and we pass key, which is uh, the name of the signing firmware signing key we're going to sign the firmware with so that when it just gets to the device, it knows it was from us. We're going to say, I want to deploy it to the displays right away. And uh, this TTL, we don't really need to worry about that part. That's, you can set a time to live on firmware so that when it's uh, uh, done being used in a deployment, you can automatically get garbage collected on the server. So it's going to say, do you want to push this firmware to the remote uh, server? Um, before I say yes, I am going to get some stuff in the view here. Where's the top of this window? There we go. All right, so I'm going to say, yep, I want to push that to these devices. I got to unlock my signing key. Now it's signed my firmware, and now I'm going to push it to the server. And voila, nine devices getting firmware updates over Wi-Fi all at once, using Live View. I'm sure that the reason this is a little slow is because I, you know, we brought our own Wi-Fi access point here, but. Uh, uh, there's a lot of phones in this room, so I'm sure there's some interference, but uh, as you can see, yeah, these report real-time uh, firmware status updates back from the server, so we can see them going on. And by the way, the game's still running, so they're receiving firmware updates, and it's some, some of them are hiccuping a little bit, but, you know, yeah, a little bit. Still, still pretty impressive. All right, let's check something else out. Uh, the fun one, here's the web server. So this is the device that's running Nerves Hub. Let's go in here and we can say, give me the remote console. And uh, I'll just go in, I'll say a U name. Oh, that's not right. Yeah, use. There we go. We can say, you know, does one plus one still equal two? Sure it does. All right. Uh, I don't know if this has an active internet connection. Weather is a fun one, but it's probably not going to work. Yeah. No. Yeah, anyways. All right, so yeah, so that's, that's how you can do that. You can go to the remote consoles and you can get information. You can even from here uh, uh, access the log messages. So we can see here all of the messages coming back to the, firm, uh, the firmware update server. And we can even do things crazy like Oops. Ah. All right, well, you know, demos. Just demos, huh? Okay. We'll kill that one. Let's see how our devices are doing. Still updating. Yeah, we're not going to wait for those. They go a lot faster over uh, AWS, uh, for sure. Uh, it's ridiculous. All right, so. That's an absurd way to be able to go over the top with uh, showing uh, a demo on how to be able to build everything. 17 core snake, everyone, yes. Uh, so in conclusion here, I'd really like to be able to put a big thank you out to our sponsors. Uh, we have a couple companies that uh, help assist in paying some of the expenses that it takes to be able to run all of these servers, all of the uh, continuous integration stuff. 
uh, to help fund new development um, and also sponsor us as developers to be able to work on the project. Uh, Latote, Smart Rent, Bowery, Erlang Solutions, and all of the individual contrib uh, contributors, uh, um, uh, and, and, and more. I mean, if I left anybody out for thanks, I mean, um, the NERVS team, Frank Hunleth, uh, Connor Rigby, Greg Mefford, and uh, uh, especially John Karstens, too, for all his help on NERVS Hub, um, and uh, for the entire community as well for all the contributions. Uh, if you want to be able to get involved and help out more, you can uh, check. We always need people to help maintain systems um, and also to update documentation and keep our NERVS, hub, uh, NERVS examples up to date. Um, you can, we're also looking for people to be able to help from the web end of things with uh, pushing the NERVS hub user interfaces on the web interfaces uh, forward uh, and also uh, back end help on that. If you want to ask questions, you can get us on the Elixir Lang Slack at uh, NERVS uh, and NERVS hub. Uh, nerves dash hub um, and also uh, check it out on the elixir forum uh, and you know uh, get involved help out and continue to push this great stuff forward so that we can continue to build these resilient embedded systems thank you <laughs>